Right, thank you very much. All right, let's uh, want to thank both, uh, both, both speakers. It was uh, excellent presentations and I'd like to open it up to a broader discussion around uh, ways to um, functionalize these variants of unknown significance or credential them or in, in some way get a, a ranking of which ones we should care about and which ones should we should care less about. So um, who wants to start it off? So, so I'm going to come back to the modeling that you've done of the, you know, trying to, to use what you're learning to, to immediately model sort of going forward. So pressing you, like, so how, how different, I mean, it looked like it was a, a lot better than sort of existing algorithms for predicting functionality. What is it that you're able to leverage? What's the new data, the new information that's making your models now so much better than sort of the generic ones were before? Well, I don't, um, I mean, with these experiments, we s explore so much more sequence space um, than I think evolution has been able to explore. So BRCA1, for example, is really not that old um, in comparison to a lot of other genes. So, you know, at each position, we're testing the effect of, like, every possible amino acid. So we get a lot more um, information out of that, I think, than, than the evolutionary conservation. So take a, a different example. Um, when you look at newborn screening and when people started adding new disorders, there was a work group and a panel, and now it's become official as part of the President's Secretary Committee. On, and they came up with specific criteria. And it seems like you want something where you're gonna, it's going to be fairly common, so all the individual intellectual disability genes, while they're important, very varied, so BRCA1, where there's some sort of treatment um, or something you could do again, and where there is a reasonable chance of developing the assay. And so I think to try to come up with some list of criteria, and then there are going to be all the nuances, and then um, some group, or to plug it into that and use that as a framework to me might make the most sense. Beyond those three, I'm not sure what other criteria are, but I'm sure everybody could come up with some um, common, treatable, doable. <laughs> can, I, can I just ask, what is not doable? Are there particular things that are very hard? Well, of course, the bigger the protein, the harder it is uh, with anything that has to deal with you know, sequencing or gene construction and stuff like that. So the bigger the protein. Um, it'll, you know, kind of scale with size. Um, so, for example, I'm terrified of B BRCA2, which is 350 amino acids. Um, yeah, um, we're, we're, we've been developing things for, for membrane proteins. You know, again, just trying to see, you know, do they get to the membrane, things like that. So there, those are questions that we can, we can start answering. Um, but the things that typically make genome sequence based analyses difficult like a lot of repetitive regions and stuff like that those are not a problem for you is that right um they they may be for example um you know when we have to make these these um repair templates sometimes you know making the the, the homology arms to those if it's in a really repetitive region we have we have trouble with that um, but once we get it cloned once um we can usually get at it pretty well And the splice site issue that you raised, is that something that you can attack at, at all, or is it just not within well, the realm? One of the things I think we're, we're planning on moving forward with is um, going with uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 based editing, saturation genome editing. And that gets both things, right? So if we can tie protein function also in, we'll get splicing and protein all at the same time. Um, we may not know actually what the effect is, whether it's, whether, whether the, you know, a, a, you know, a depletion of that variant is due to RNA or protein, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, if it's, if it's gone, it's gone, so. A couple of simple questions, actually, for Leah. So with the CRISPR editing, are you mostly making homozygous changes, or will they mo mostly be heterozygous? In, that? Um, in this case, because we were looking at RNA, it didn't matter. Um, mm -hmm. But for, uh, going forward, we're actually going to be knocking out one copy and then targeting the second. 
So you'll delete one copy entirely exactly. and then go, yeah, right, that makes perfect sense. Exactly. And re regarding the splicing changes, so maybe I misunderstood, but it seems as though your assay would allow you to pick up exonic splicing changes. Can you also pick up intronic? Uh, so, you know, di di potentially, I mean, one, one class of variants I'm very interested in is deeper intronic splice mm -hmm. gain variants. We've, we've seen a number of these now from RNA-seq in muscle disease patients but they're right. incredibly difficult to predict in advance. We have not targeted them yet. Um, again, with the repair templates, we could, you know, take our, our variable region and just spread it mm -hmm. kind of, you know, 50 bases on both sides of the exon, and that would be something mm -hmm. that we could definitely do. Although the only problem is that when you're trying to sequence the RNA, yeah. it's not there, right. but it would drop out from the gene, from, it, you know, if you're selecting for function of the protein, you know, those variants would be, depleted from the genomic mm -hmm. DNA too, but not being able to see them in the first yeah. place would be the, you know, kind of an absence of evidence kind of situation. So yeah, that's what I figured. It seems like at least with, with exonic variants, you can see it directly in the cDNA, so that makes life a lot easier. Yeah, yeah so that, that might be a harder thing to do. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Scott and then Mike. This is really not a comment on the last two talks, but a more, con uh, more a comment on functional variation generally and what's needed in the context of uh, uh, translating this into the clinic. It, it, one of the biggest problems, uh, uh, I think, is, is that there's a lack of standardization of the nomenclature around uh, molecular genetics, molecular biology, and the functional assessment of variants. And so some people will approach this from uh, using nomenclature that's more re related to the protein, and some approach it from the molecular genetic side. but. The problem is, is that when clinical geneticists are evaluating a VUS, they go to the literature and they have to read every article. And it, it, there's not an ability to bioinformatically mine the literature for what these functional effects are in any sort of organized way. So it would really be, you know, along the lines of what Callum was saying about phenotype, it would really help if we had standardization around functional nomenclature because that would allow us to much more rapidly evaluate the literature and help to translate this into clinical practice. It's a, it's a huge issue, I think, uh, uh, because it, it, what you find is people sometimes are calling the same gene or variant by completely different names and people are confused and don't even know what they're talking about. So uh, <clears throat> that's clearly something that would be of value. Mike was next, but since your hand rose directly from, is this directly from yeah. Mike? Okay. Yeah. And then, then so I'm going to talk a little bit later about this, but we're actually, um, when you look across um, differences in variant calling, it's always the functional evidence that causes differences in those calls, right? So we've been working um, as part of an NCI contract to build a, an, um, exactly what you just suggested, which is different computational models for how you represent functional evidence so that we can start um, building those sorts of representations that can live outside the papers so that we can aggregate them and compute over them. So, and I'd love to talk to you more about requirements for that. Um, well, most assistants will be directed, and then, then for sure, Mike after that. Um, one thing I wanted to say about um, standardizing functional evidence, there is a resource called Vario, um, variation, um, I, don't, I think it's variation ontology, but really it's, it's functional terms for, uh, standard terms to describe, it's a decrease in the protein activity or something. Um, it's a fairly limited set of terms right now, and I think there's a lot of groups who would like to use it, but I think they are short on funding. So that's one thing to consider. Um, the other thing that was mentioned are standards for genes and variants. I think genes, there is a standard HGNC. I think we just have to encourage use of that. For variants, um, that is a big problem in standardization of variants, but there is um, work going on in NCBI to develop an allele registry, which would be um, a database where you can submit your description of your variant. Um, we can normalize it, so no matter how you describe it, left shifted, right shifted, HDVS or chromosome coordinates, we can let you know you're all talking about the same variant, so this could help um, with literature mining and making sure that everybody knows when they're talking about the same thing. So an RSID for function or something like that? Uh, yeah, so this would be more specific than an RSID it would right. be for the allele. Right. Yeah. So I was thinking about our two talks together this morning and a question that Dan, Dan Roden was asking. And it occurs to me that there should be a class of variants out there that's going to be especially hard to track down. If you look at receptor tyrosine kinases, sometimes when they're expressed at low levels, 
when they're activated, they trigger differentiation. Sometimes when they're expressed at high levels, same intrinsic activity of the enzyme, yet now they trigger cell proliferation. So expression differences can lead to very different phenotypes without necessarily changing the intrinsic function of the protein. I don't think this is a problem in these kinds of studies. You'll still find a lot of useful stuff if you miss certain rare things. You know, any advance is a good advance and that's helpful. But in terms of interpreting negative results, one might sometimes say, oh, well, this shouldn't have mattered according to this one line of evidence. Yet it does have, you know, there's an effect, so maybe the connection is wrong. But in fact, this emergent property could be important. So it, seem, it seems to me, we're going back to the focus of the meeting, which is to think about um, the issue of buses and functionalizing buses. That the two talks we just heard and, and the, maybe the talks yesterday are really kind of in the basic science trenches, right? It's really about developing fundamental methodologies to scale our ability to apply some sort of rational functional significance to the variants that we're discovering. I think one of the things that's missing on that treacherous bridge between basic science and clinical translation is having more opportunities for people developing these technologies to be in the presence and discuss with people who are more on the clinical side about maybe how to direct the, the, the actions, the next steps in developing the technologies. And I think, and I'm going to put Doug on the spot because we had a quick meeting in the lobby and, and he was actually saying this meeting was maybe changing a little bit about how he thought about focusing just because he wasn't necessarily aware before of some of the clinical parameters about the significance of the work he's doing. So I, I think even though what, what we are hearing today is really basic science, it's to me if we're going to make this relevant we have to have more opportunities for the for the communication with the basic scientists again and the clinicians. And I'm, I'm going to ask Doug to, to say just a few words, um, if you would. I guess you should be careful about lobby conversations. Come back to bite you. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's true, right? We, um, we very much want to contribute to this problem in a real way, right? And, it, and it, nobody can know everything. And, Clearly on the basic side, like what we don't know is exactly what kind of information is going to be most useful and also where to point, you know, where to point ourselves, where to point the ship. Um, and we have an inkling, but uh, the devil is in the details. So, you know, just hearing how, how you all are thinking uh, about this problem is, is hugely enlightening. Um, you know, it's exciting for us to talk about what we can do and, and to think about like what Howard asked questions about cost and scale and how do we actually, you know, how do we actually do that and we have good ideas, but ultimately we have to scale to like the right thing. Um, otherwise it, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to be as useful. So, and the right time to do that is before we invest all the time and effort, right? So, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's great. And we had talked about maybe trying to develop a sort of a specific list and we've heard more about, you know, what that list would be in terms of, you know, um, common, treatable and doable. That was a good one. Um, but that, that's absolutely critical and that, you know, it's, it's, so I, I, I anyway appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and listen. Yeah. Yep. So as the functional assessments are developed, I'm, I'm struck by your comment that it's hard when you have a clinical variant to search databases. Could ClinGen develop an arm that would be for functional genomic data relative to specific genes? I don't know if that's something ClinGen has thought about adding, but um, I think it would be very important to put this data into some context that is searchable when you need it clinically. And, and also, by doing that, you could bring in functional genomicists and drive maybe what they're doing by what is most clinically uh, relevant or important or, you know, at least advise um, in some way. Since uh, Queen Clinton is not in her seat, her throne, um, I'll, um, 
mention this one thing briefly and then, then Mark can also comment. Um, certainly within the, the working groups that I'm involved in in ClinGen, uh, the, the functional data is being annotated in a semi-quantitative way and working through some wording to try to reflect that. Now, you know, that's pharmacogenomics where there's, you know, extensive metabolism versus normal versus poor, um, or in the, the somatic area where there's some level of function. So it's, it's in there, but, what, but it's not being done in a way that's uniform across the working groups that I'm aware of. But maybe Mark would have, Mark would have a better view. Yeah, um, as you know, uh, Deborah, the, the ClinGen is, is having all the working groups uh, utilize um, the ACMG approach to uh, annotation um, or um, to at least um, explicitly define the uh, annotation uh, approaches that they're using, which should include functional uh, data. Now, at the present time, the um, actual ability to access the functional studies uh, wouldn't be available through the site. But the, I think, as Howard pointed out, um, that information is certainly being considered. Uh, the references for those that are published are um, uh, uh, to be posted on the site, but there would be no reason not to consider um, creating some type of a link through to, uh, if there were a data repository of functional information um, that could be pointed to through the resource, I think that that would be uh, something that would be um, quite valuable. Well, my only thought is that Clin that's helpful if ClinGen is working on what mutation you happen to have found or what gene you think may be causing your patient's um, disease process or symptoms. But if there were a repository somehow of functional data across the genome of whatever investigator is doing whatever work that's functional genomics, it you could access it as a clinical search even if ClinGen isn't targeting that specific gene yet. Yeah, I think that would be something that would have to be thought about within the scope of ClinGen, which has been primarily focused on being a clinically relevant variant resource. Um, and uh, I think one of the discussion points is, well, how it's not to say that this isn't clinically relevant, but it's probably not clinically relevant in terms of the target audience uh, that we're thinking of for ClinGen. So then the question comes up is we have the ability within ClinGen to aggregate other resources, and we've already done that uh, on the website. So if a resource like this existed, would it be of value to have um, that represented on our resource page that people could then go through ClinGen uh, to actually access it? And then for those um, uh, variants where the functional information is directly relevant, then you could uh, uh, link that. Yeah. Now, Mike, you want to jump in on this? Okay, yeah, I, I don't know if this would be considered to be clinically relevant functional genomics or not, but um, there are two freely available resources, RegulomeDB and Haploreg. Both of those are connected to ENCODE, funded by ENCODE, and having code resource uh, information as well as data from other projects like um, Common Fund epi Epigenomics, GTEx, and so forth. And they could either be linked to by ClinGen or searched by anybody that has internet access. There's no password or sign in or anything. Thanks. Callum? Just to make the obvious statement that you could potentially connect the type of basic science assays with a new clinical assays if you picked universal enough assays. Obviously, you need, in, in terms of the proximate assays that we were talking about yesterday, you need things at multiple levels of scale. But one of the levels of scale that would be potentially powerful would be cell biology actually in the clinic and have those cellular assays be represented universally in some of the basic science projects would immediately make the connections that we're talking about. So. Well, there's different levels of, of use. Um, you know, for trying to you know, publish in, in cell, you want a certain quality of data. Um, if you're trying to choose between two therapeutic options for a patient that will be seen uh, on Thursday, uh, you just need a feather that will tip the scale. And, and that's where some of the data that, that you know, I, I think Doug, you were kind of commenting about your earlier data, you know, it's not quite you know, it's not quite this, not quite that. But it, we're in a situation, clinically, at least on the cancer side, where we just want some direction, and we don't assume that we will be directed to perfect 
or to e maybe even to grade. <laughs> and you know, I'm not even sure if it's good, but it's, it's something. Because uh, the, the goal often in, our, in the patients we're seeing are how can we keep them alive long enough to benefit from new science? It's not how do we cure them? I mean, we'd like to do that. But how do we keep them alive in a quality state long enough so when something that will cure them comes, they're ready? Um, and, and so in that case, just tipping the scale uh, amongst these two options is enough. So the, the bar in some contexts is quite low, and then on others, it's, it's quite high. No, I, I completely agree. And for germline conditions, you can imagine exactly the same. You don't need something that's necessarily line of sight mechanistically involved with the gene. If, with the way that we conceive of how the gene leads to the clinical phenotype, if you know that you know, that cell state is perturbed in that individual ab initio, just simply because you have a massive repository of functional annotation f uh, for that particular state. You know, we, we, the one example that um, cellular electrophysiology is so powerful, one of the reasons the ECG is actually a potent tool is because, and it's representing what's actually happening at a cellular level, the real linear correlations between a 12-lead electrocardiogram and what happens in a xenopus oocyte. If we could imagine doing that across even, let's say, 10 or 12 domains, suddenly you have exactly the ability to do what you're saying you need in somatic cells. Um, Mike and then Peter. So sometimes at this meeting I've been hearing the tension between the importance of diagnosis, between the importance of treatment. And I'd like to bring out that functional genomics could have importance in terms of treatment. Imagine a patient in the clinic, they have a skin disorder. You have a variant. You want to know is that variant causal or not. But perhaps you could also learn from that variant, does that variant work in a lymphocyte, suggesting autoimmunity or inflammatory, or does it work in a keratinocyte or a melanocyte? And that could lead to treatment options. If you've got, a, you know, exuberant lymph immune response, immunosuppressant agents could be a place to start. So that's another way that functional genomics could help, not just telling you which variants might be causal, but what the pathogenesis might be, and that could suggest treatment mode. I was just going to respond to Mike's point, which I think is excellent. Actually, in, in one of the projects of the Undiagnosed Diseases Consortium, that's actually the focus is because we find it not universally possible to get to causality with a single patient in a genome, can we get to therapeutic intervention based on pathway analysis? So. In all of this wave of optimism, I, I hope I'm not going to make a lot of enemies by saying this, but in my experience, the, the maximum path length between any uh, variant and any treatment is, is for, uh, or by anybody a beer who says, connect this and that with a path length of four in PubMed, I will find it. And so I think by, by providing that kind of a resource, that's an enormous responsibility. And um, I, I think we're pretty far away from providing reliable clinical clues in a lot of areas. And I think if one does go this way, then it's really important to develop software that will basically not just provide links in a way that, say, ingenuity software often does exuberantly, but also to provide the, the complete evidence, the provenance of statements, and also to provide um, contrasting ideas. And be, because, uh, you know, human intuition is, is, is great, but um, there's a high probability of misleading it in, the, in a certain direction based on some chance link in a database um, with, with this type of software. Realism is welcome, just in moderation. Uh, uh, Mark? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, those points are, are well taken from the perspective of going from um, a disease-causing variant and trying to um, uh, move into uh, therapy. But I think there's another approach um, that we haven't discussed much, which is to uh, say, what are the opportunities to recapitulate the PCSK9 story? In other words, identify our unusual individuals that have not a disease phenotype, but have some type of a strong protective phenotype. In this case, you know, very low LDL cholesterol levels that have, that also seem to have low incident cardiovascular disease um, that is due to a genetic knockout uh, that just occurred naturally that doesn't appear to have any sort of other phenotypic impact uh, uh, negative for the patient. 
that then immediately led to a therapeutic intervention, which is um, you know inhibitor of PCSK9 um, that is now available for treatment that actually took place over a relatively short period of time. Now the strategy of identifying those um, uh, you know resilient individuals and 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 defining what those phenotypes would be would be problematic. But I think if we were able to define a handful of those and take advantage of large scale. Uh, sequence data combined with the ability to do rapid functional assays to say what exactly is going on that's resulting in the phenotype, that could actually result in a therapeutic approach in a relatively short order. So uh, I, I want to echo what Mark said. I think that uh, the idea of looking at people who I'm not sure this is on topic, but you started this, so I'm going to continue. <laughs> looking, at, looking, looking at people who, who should have disease but don't uh, is, uh, is a really appealing one. The, I think the problem, as, as you and I both know, is that it's, it's easy to find people with diabetes. It's hard to find people who should have diabetes but don't. So the denominator has to be really, really big before you start to sort of get into finding that handful of patients with confidence. It's, it's, it's hard to find them, and it's even harder to find them and be sure you found them. So those are the, and, and so one, another way to do it is to go at it through a genetic sort of approach and say, here are alleles that we think might be protected. That was the PCSK9 approach, in, in fact, initially. And then, and then go after those individuals in, a, in, in some kind of, uh, you know, prospective way or in the way in which the PCSK9 story evolved. So starting with, you know, alleles that you think are protective and then asking the question, are they protective? Or starting with patients who ought to have, you know, the 95-year-old smoker who doesn't have lung cancer, that kind of stuff. But it's hard to find those people. Right. But it gets back to what um, I think Les was talking about yesterday is that if we can find those, um, uh, you know, the biomarkers that don't have, you know, 10 inferential steps, but have one or two inferential steps where you have a pretty robust association. And that was what made the PCSK9 work, is that we knew that LDL cholesterol, you know, was directly relevant to incident cardiovascular disease. And so we could look at that and look for outliers that had exceedingly low LDL cholesterol levels. Um, you could p potentially in the lipid field look at individuals um, that have extremely high HDL cholesterol levels and see, you know, what uh, what that is. I mean, in our initial 50,000 that we looked at, we have uh, a couple hundred individuals that have multiple HDL measurements of 250 or greater. You know, there's probably something interesting going on with those folks. Now, whether that would lead to a therapeutic uh, intervention, given what we're now learning about HDL, is, is, is a different question. Um, but that would be the idea is that, you know, are there measurable biomarkers that, that are quantitative that we could search for that we are, we are confident are associated with the disease phenotype so that you could really then say, well, this is an individual that is unlikely to develop this disease based on this particular marker. Terry and then Jose. So, so it sounds like we're, we're talking about, you know, a disease-first approach or a lack of disease-first approach and a genotype-first approach. And Daniel described already, you know, many, I, I can't remember how many you can remind us, um, you know, human knockouts you've already found for genes that you're not sure what they do. Can, can you remind me of those hundreds or so, dozens or? Yeah, so there's thousands. Okay. Thousands. And, there's, oh. and there's, there's work underway at the moment actually to identify more knockouts. Um, if we're interested in homozygous knockouts, of course, the right strategy is not to go after outbred Europeans, it's to look at consanguinous populations. And there was a, a paper published from a UK group, which we were involved in uh, about a month ago, looking at a UK consanguinous population. They identified, from memory, just over a, a, a thousand uh, knocked out genes in that population. We have another paper coming out, hopefully in the next couple of months, looking at another consanguinous population with similar numbers. Mm -hmm. so, so these, if we're interested in finding human knockouts, the, those are great populations to go after. And th these, I think, are telling us a couple of things. The first is a, a lesson that we learned a long time ago, which is that you have to be extremely careful about how you annotate knockout, so-called knockout variants. And many of these, the genes find some way of escaping what looks like it should be a, a protein truncating variant. There's exon skipping or splicing or some, something else that happens. Um, but, it, but even so, once you do get rid of the, the real artifacts, there clearly are a lot of genes that can tolerate a complete knockout in, a, in an individual who appears to be healthy, perhaps has some subclinical phenotypes, but, it, but definitely, you know, is, is present in the population. I think that strategy is going to teach us a lot about gene function in a, in a set of genes about which we currently have virtually no, or, or in some cases, absolutely no uh, phenotypical functional annotation. 
So it would seem if, you know, we talked yesterday a little bit about how do you prioritize all the, all the genes on, on Doug's list or on anybody's list, you know, in, in, in terms of what's important. And we've been asking that question since the GWAS days or even, even before. Um, but it seems like these would be a, a reasonable set. And, mm -hmm. and one could use IPS. I mean, what you'd like to do, obviously, is go back to these people and yep. phenotype the heck out of them. Um, but you, in some cases, you're not able to do that. So, so would IPS or, or other kinds of, of, you know, basic techniques be possible? I would think they would. For sure. I mean, in, in both of these cohorts, it's actually possible to recall individuals for genotype-directed follow-up, and we've um, said uh, there's there's been a, a number of experiments like that that have already been done. Um, now, obviously, recall doesn't always work. Sometimes you lose the person, or sometimes you can't follow up. But uh, but I think again, these are great examples of cohorts where, particularly the UK cohort, was collected right from the very beginning as being a cohort of consanguineous individuals that was deliberately collected as a group that we could return to and re-genotype, uh, re re-phenotype when, when something interesting was found. Um, IPS, though, I think is a, is a good model. Obviously, there are certain types of experiments you can do in IPS cells that can't be done in humans, and it's nice to be able to look at um, exactly, particularly for validating whether or not a variant is actually loss of function. Often what you need to do is look at the expression of the transcript or the protein in whatever tissue that gene is supposed to be expressed in. And, and in, for many of those tissues, you can't biopsy a living human to get that. So having iPS cells that you can use to validate those findings is extremely useful. Jose? And then Mike Moore. This was uh, related to these resilience genes that we are talking about. I was going to comment that about that this afternoon, but it's, it's already on the table. And uh, I agree with the difficulties because, for example, uh, talking about lipids, it's a monogenic disorder, well, relatively monogenic disorder, like it's uh, FH, right? Familiar hypercholesterolemia. We thought, I mean, we had collected about a few thousand people with FH, and there were people there with very high LDL cholesterol and no disease at all. So I mean, it was a given. We were going to find with GWAS uh, the genes that were responsible for that protection. We couldn't, even with uh, that clear phenotype. Uh, and then remember the paper that was published uh, last week in Nature Biotechnology in which they took the same approach, but they did it with 600,000 people and they found 13 people that they had to have a disease but didn't have it. The complexity comes in that the uh, investigators were not able to recall these 13 people to investigate them further. So great uh, finding with a very large uh, population, minimal, fi minimal finding, but maybe may be informative, but we are with our hands tied because we cannot back to them. Yeah. I mean, if nothing else, it gives Dan Roden a number of how many people he needs to search. Yeah. You know, it's it's 600,000, Dan. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I think as we, uh, we think about our priority list for this, another way to think about it is we're on the verge of having uh, large numbers of people with sequence data through PMI and, and other efforts. And one effort will be to go into that sequence data and figure out who's at risk for diseases that we prioritize or conditions. So, so there's three public health genomics conditions that that usually get talked about. One of them is FH, as has, has been brought up, uh, BRCA, and Lynch. So that's nine genes out of the 56. I think they're the priority. Now, one thing that was mentioned, uh, I think Daniel mentioned it when during his, is th there's a, a number of genes uh, that, that um, have you know KIAA and a bunch of numbers or whatever, and we don't really have a clue what they do. And uh, those genes, there seems to be a, a predilection for finding something really interesting in a gene like that. Um, and maybe we just remember that sort of thing. But uh, be interested in in strategies for uh, high throughput, high uh, at least maybe somewhat superficial strategies for trying to figure out what do they mean. And Nancy, maybe you can kick that off. Well, one of the things that I'll talk about this afternoon is this gene by medical phenome catalog that we're creating at Vanderbilt using the genetically predicted expression of genes. So you can think of a big knockdown experiment for every gene in the genome um, that we interrogate at least through GTEx, and an upregulation experiment on every gene in the genome 
um, where we're looking as, at the readout as what of the medical phenome is associated with the altered expression of these genes. And you're absolutely right. Of the genes with unattractive names, the KIAA and the you know, C1 or F163, there are, there are hundreds of genes that have the same characteristics with respect to the phenome that they attract on, say, reduced predicted expression of multiple congenital anomalies, intellectual disability, and a lot of other bad phenotypes. There are Mendelian genes in waiting. I mean, we will find there will be Mendelian genes associated, Mendelian diseases associated with these genes, and we'll have a database to help people find those because we know what congenital anomalies will be associated with the, you know, knockouts of these genes because they're associated with just being two or three standard deviations below the mean for expression of these genes. So that's one high throughput way that we can get an insight into the medical phenome function of genes who, whose function we otherwise don't have any idea about. It's funny you call them uh, unattractive. We actually, we actually had, had a discussion. They're unattractively named. Named, so yes, yes. beautiful the genes. genes. Well, we thought about giving them a name that had cell death somewhere in there because then everyone would work on it, you know, because uh, so. Um, Melissa? And then. Since this is um, today, I wasn't here yesterday, but today seems to be a little bit about cross-species um, informatics. I just wanted to mention a resource that we work closely with, with which is the BG resource, which is a cross-species gene expression um, database. And as I've seen, as I'll show later, there's you know there's a lot of data in the models that we just don't have about human genes. So if, based on orthology, if we combine that ortholo orthologous um, gene expression patterns from that resource, and that's a fantastic resource with the kind of work that you're doing, we might actually get somewhere. Great. Is this safe? I, I just want to just remind um, everyone, I think everyone knows, that the comp project really has generated a huge resource. So one could always look up your favorite KIA gene and find the mouse ortholog. And there may be actually information um, about whether it's uh, viable, um, because a lot of the, the genes are now systematically getting knocked out. And then, as I mentioned before, also with mutagenesis, there are a lot of alleles being generated from many genes. And in some cases, they're incidental. But if you know the, um, the nature of the screen, then you, you might know whether it's actually if it's embryonic viable, because there are screens, for example, adult phenotypes. And incidental mutations come along. They may include your favorite gene. And so um, if there's a way you could search that, and I, I know that the, um, there's a large-scale um, screen for immune dysfunction genes, so these are largely adult viable. I think all those mutations are also curated um, in MGI. So if you type in the gene name, you actually can pull them out. And so, um, so that may be some way to resource um, information that may already be in the, uh, in, in, in the databases. Yeah, that's very helpful. Good, please. I think Melissa might be talking a little bit about that, but one of the things that we've done is to create a cross-species phenotype resource where, for instance, we use ontologies to map hypoplastic snout to small nose, and we've created software to actually evaluate an exome or, or a genome sequence by entering human phenotype terms and matching this against corresponding mouse uh, and fish phenotype profiles, and, and I, I think we're basically just at the beginning of this thanks to projects like COMP and IMPC and uh, improvements in our, our ontologies that are underway. Oh, so gene editing on the snout thing sounds pretty appealing. <laughs> um, I, I wonder, we just have a couple minutes left in this, in this session, um, and not, not to put you in the spot, but um, I'd be really interested, Monty, if you had any, as you've been thinking about this, because you've been kind of living this interface for, for a while, anything that comes to mind as you... Uh, as you've been taking this session in. And sorry for uh, not giving you a heads up for the question. Uh, I'm always uh, happy to have questions, particularly ectopic questions. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, I really enjoy the way this conversation is going right now because I think we're coming back to that interface between the clinic and the basic research. And uh, so in addition to the comp, uh, there's also the uh, wonderful resource given to us by the uh, Sanger Institute where uh, over half the genes have been knocked out in zebrafish and 
<coughs> and we have that uh, phenotype information as well. And uh, so in addition to MGI, I just put a plug in for CFIM, uh, which also provides this uh, uh, phenotypic information. And uh, the resource that Peter and uh, Melissa uh, is working on uh, really closely integrates uh, that information with human data. So these are resources I think that clinicians in general really don't know too much about. Yeah, as the flood of acronyms continues, uh, it strikes me that a very easy thing uh, to do as an outcome of this meeting would be an aggregation of all of the resources that uh, we think might be potentially relevant to facilitate work uh, between the bench and the bedside. And so, you know, a, uh, um, a, an actual name with the acronym plus a brief description of what we think that would do that could be distributed and p potentially even uh, posted um, uh, somewhere in the N NHGRI, I, I think would be uh, very useful and would be a very um, tangible output of the meeting. I, I received a text last night from one of my bioinformatics colleagues who requested that I just have one email with all the different sites that he want, that I want him to look at because I was sending him an email every time one popped up yesterday. <laughs> and he said, you know, please, you know, <laughs> before I put you on my spam list, uh, just, just put in one, right? Anyway. All right, um, two last uh, comments before we uh, finish up. So, so to take that idea a little further, Mark, it, it, a list of all the resources would be nice, but, uh, you know, a, a long, a medium-term goal or a longer-term goal might be to figure out ways of actually having those lists talk to each other. I think Dan said this last, yesterday and Doug said this yesterday. I think that, that, you know, you'd look up a variant. You might start in XAC, but it would have a link to something with a link to something else, with a link to so, or, or all in one place, just sort of saying, what is the totality of the evidence uh, where is the evidence? So maybe there is evidence in ZFIN or not, uh, but if there were, that would be listed. And, and so some way to integrate them as opposed to making us look up 27 different data sites. Yeah, I noticed Wendy is uh, uh, absent today, but that seems like a, a well, definitely. And, oh, I'm sure. Oh, you are here. Are you were hiding. You were hiding. Yeah, uh, quiet as usual. Yeah, yeah, Wendy. Right. Dun, 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 so dun, that dun. sounds like an excellent job for NCBI, I think. My, my comment was on the same vein, some uh, a list and then working with each of those resources, even like an API, a standard API that would let MD who wants to query them send it that query and have something returned using good mappings for the different uh, orthologs from all those resources would be great. There's some work in that direction already, but it's not comprehensive and it's not totally aligned. I, I would just add, I mean, a lot of the model organism databases already do have um, uh, human disease orthology pages uh, or uh, orthologies between different model organisms. So, you know, maybe some resource that collected that all in one place would be helpful. And to, maybe to, you're already doing it. We're well, doing a need to do just about that, yeah. Just to say con continued investment in that work because that's a large task would be critical. Melissa, and then and last word from Les. So, um, well, this is exactly what we work on, <laughs> is trying to aggregate all of the model data with the human data. Um, there are other people doing similar things. But one thing, the point I wanted to make, too, is that, you know, one of the issues that, amongst all the data integration issues, and there are many to choose from, um, one of the things about disease modeling is, is there are many different ways of modeling diseases and associating a model with a, um, a patient disease. So you can, um, you can assert that something is a model of a disease. You can look at it based on orthology. You can look at it based on it being part of the same pathway. You can look at phenotype comparisons. You can look for gene enrichment. There's a whole slew of ways that you can say that a model might be related to a patient. And we need to be aggregating all those different ways um, together into one resource with all the different models in order to really um, fill in these data gaps that we see um, from not having enough information on the human side. Uh, the other thing that would make it extraordinarily useful and add a lot of value, especially considering the theme of this meeting, which is how do we use functional data to uh, modify the pathogenicity of uh, variants, especially uh, those of unknown significance, is obviously we want to use these data to as a conditional probability. So what we need to know for each of these attributes is what's the likelihood of observing that piece of data were it to be pathogenic versus were it to be benign because that's the probability we need to do the formal Bayesian uh, 
posterior based on that piece of data. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, the two speakers and then uh, also the whole group for the active discussion. We'll take a break and start up uh, 10.15 with uh, Carol and the chair.